Maybe, maybe. It's, it's like and they have signage the, too and all Yeah, it might be the and, quaint part, right? Which is, yeah. oh, it's a lemonade stand and I get my EV charge. That's probably yeah. the real business model. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. That, might, that could be fun, right? <laughs> All right, this is another episode of Founders Pack Form Your Own Pack podcast. My guest today is well known to people in Founders Pack. This is Sean Flynn, who's been a judge on multiple pitch events. Sean, thanks for joining me. Oh, no, Michael, thank you. I, I love what you're doing in the startup ecosystem and all the entrepreneurs you're helping. And your events have been fantastic. I've met some great entrepreneurs. So thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. I'm glad you said that. Well, for people that don't know, who is Sean Flynn? Um, I'm a principal at a mid-market investment bank, but I also have two other things that I focus on when I'm not doing my, I, I almost want to say nine to nine. I have, <laughs> right. it's true though. <laughs> I'm the right. host of the Silicon Valley podcast where I interview entrepreneurs, venture capital, and leaders in tech. I've interviewed people such as Jim McKelvey, co-founder Square, Melody Perkins, Canva. In fact, I just brokered a relationship between two past guests, uh, Shalom, who's the Consulate General of Israel, uh, Abram Miller, who's the co-founder of Intel Capital, listened to that episode. He was oh, a past wow. guest and asked me to make an introduction. So that was pretty cool. That's so I've crazy. interviewed some, some pretty <laughs> impressive people on the show. And then um, also recently, I've taken over Bay Angels, which is oh, you did. the second oldest angel group in Silicon Valley. So oh, it's wow. been in hibernation for two and a half years, more like three years. And so now we're just rebuilding everything. And people should uh, start looking for us to start holding some events. Q, you know, end of Q3 this year. Hopefully we can do a partnership event with Founders Pack. Just throw it out there right now. I think it'd be fun. So um, yeah, look for that. Well, and that's interesting. I didn't realize that you had taken over Bay Angels. So we're excited to hear that. And we'll absolutely do events with you. We have a lot of founders up in the Bay Area, actually, that have been saying, hey, will you do an event there? Because we have an event coming up in Austin, and then we'll do another one in um, Orange County, and then another one in nashville but you know we got to do san francisco before probably the end of september so if you do one here we got access to a lot of venues and yeah that. let's I mean, do it we could we could do one in person it would be a lot of fun we can we could fill the place all right sold you hear yeah. it here first so. <laughs> all right so when you're um i guess what sort of companies do you typically deal with like and what size of business good question for angels it's normally c to a round um that are non-medical, non-cannabis, uh, but pretty much any sector to look at. For what I do during the day, companies are a little bit later stage because Com- everything we do, the transaction size has to be north of $10 million. Okay. Whether that's raising growth capital, whether that's getting acquired, whether that's looking for another company to acquire, whatever it is, if it's less than that, yes, there's an occasion we'll take it on, but it's just because they're being place in a position where a second or third transaction we can work with them or will come about because of that. And that's just because of how the math pencils out, just because when you're working with an investment bank, there's a lot of people involved, a lot of man hours that go into things. And there's really a minimum that has to be taken in by the bank. And unless the transaction amount is a good enough size, too much of the, the transaction is eaten up by the bank itself. So, you know, if it deals 1 million, 2 million, we would just take too much of that to make sense to work with us. So really, you know, we say 10 million up because at that point, we're just a small percentage on, uh, on, the, on the transaction. And then the services we provide really benefits the people, you know, so it makes a lot of sense to get us involved with numbers. Okay, so that's really interesting. So what sort of industries or what sort of businesses do you typically see when you're working with them? Great question. The businesses we look at, since we're based more on the transaction size than than anything else, we really look at and have done deals with almost any sector. And a lot of that is because we have 15 principals at the bank. Most of them have 20, 30 years experience, have done deals with, you name it, from doing roll-ups of apparel companies in Mexico to taking companies public in London to, you know, just you name it, someone has had an experience, you know, selling a logistics company in Europe, the list goes on and on. 
The one thing that we can't really touch right now, and that's because of federal regulations, are things that touch you know, cannabis, the plant itself. Off-plant drones, ag tech devices, IoT, all those, super fascinating, love it. Oh, really? I think, oh, yeah. As long as it's off-plant, we're good to go. And honestly, there's so much potential in a lot of these companies. Yes, there's been kind of that, you know, I don't want to say decrease in, in the industry as a whole as things become commoditized. Right. But there's a lot of stuff in ag tech itself that's really interesting that, you know, applies to, to a, that industry and a lot of others. So, so we'll look at things being on based in Silicon Valley on the Silicon Valley team. Yes, we come across more in the tech area. Mm-hmm. We deal with a lot of SaaS companies, uh, fintech yeah. and that, but SaaS has been very exciting, especially with the multiples. And, you know, there was that dip at the beginning of the pandemic as people were cutting some of the, the services. But, you know, now that everyone's working from home, there's been so many new applications that people have been implementing. And a lot of great businesses have been built just in the last two years that are, yeah. because of the multiples in SaaS, are <laughs> now entering, you know, our sweet spot. So I'm having a lot of conversations in that sector and, you know, there's a lot happening there. So for, what, what are you seeing as far as for software companies specific? Because we do have a lot of software entrepreneurs. Are, are they, what size of business are they typically for SaaS? Are they kind so, of like two, three million revenue or is it 10 million or? Good question. I mean, it's all over the place. Normally companies will start coming to us once they get that one to two million ARR. Oh. Uh, and before that, Okay. I mean, the, the typical buyers for them, if it's under a million dollars, so talking about getting acquired, there's certain investors that have their investment thesis where there's thresholds, right? So at a 1 million AR, certain investors will look at it, whereas below that, they just wouldn't be able to because of their investment thesis, what they've raised money on to use for. A lot of the buyers that we work with they have that 1 million, 2 million, or 5 million ARR minimum. And once a, a company hits one of those thresholds, a whole new buyer's pool opens up. So, so for us, yes, you know, we'll start having conversations at that 1 million. We like the 2 million, but if we can talk to people at 5 million, that, that's really good. That is a nice spot. Okay. So you know, there, there's, the first, there's the M&A part, which you kind of alluded to. Do you have people that are kind of doing roll-up deals these days? Like, I think there's a lot of room for consolidation. So I, like, where would something like that go? Would they go to talk to you? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot happening in the industry. I mean, so many private equity groups, so many institutions raised a ton of capital and they're just sitting on it right now. Hmm. And with so many uncertainties, they've, you know, you, you, you've seen the last month, two months where they're just kind of staying on the sidelines, but they still have all this capital that they're, you know, beforehand they had to deploy. Now they're they're starting to get more and more itchy to deploy, and depending on the size of the company, like if it's five million ARR, that's big enough for most of them to look at as, hey, this could be a platform company. And what right. that means is that's the company that then they buy others and, and roll into. Roll yeah. If it's smaller, maybe two million ARR, one million ARR, that'd be one of those companies they would roll into one of these platform companies. So we're getting emails all the time from hey, we just acquired a platform company three, six months ago. We're looking for add-ons. This is what we're looking for specifically. So a lot of great conversations are happening there. And a lot of these companies that started you know, one or two years ago, they're really in good positions to be one of these add-ons to one of these platforms that may have started you know, three to five years ago that just got acquired recently. So a lot's happening. Oh, that's super interesting because I I think that, you know, to your point, there's been, it's the barrier to entry to start something is fairly low now. So you see a lot of people that maybe they build a good product, but they're not great at acquiring clients, or maybe they're good at acquiring and the technology starts to age out. And I think that there's definitely like, we're, you know, we have a future guest, Andrew from MicroAcquire. And he started a whole platform. I don't know if you, you've probably met Andrew, right? I, I got the award for one of the top closers on MicroAcquire. Oh really? So, yeah, okay. I, I've Isn't known Paul, the guy in charge of MA. I've been I've been buddies with him for about eight or nine years now. Super. I mean, their whole team, everyone that I, I've gotten to meet, James or lawyer, I've gotten to meet quite a few of them. Okay. Super good guys, all of them. Um, are we talking this? I wonder if we're talking the same one. 
we're talking Mike Requires, Andrew Idrowski or something. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yep. He's, a, he's blown up on Twitter. That's yeah, all he I is. know. Yeah, so we're, we, anyways, so I think that's- He's based example. here in San Mateo or Mike Requires okay, based- Okay, we are yeah. kind of the same one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, he, you know, he's built a really interesting Dude, business. Michael, I got three articles on their platform. Oh, you do? Check them out. Check okay, out the, check the articles there. In fact, if, if any of your audience we'll wants to connect me on LinkedIn, under my uh, articles, there's the three that are, are written on that for that platform. One's oh, on, uh, uh, let's see, mental wellness for the process. One's on the difference in the um, deal structure. Okay. And then the third one is um, it's talking about whether, you know, active process or passive process for getting your company acquired. Oh, so they got a pretty good library of resources. Yeah, that, they, I mean, they, that's, that is true. They have great content and I have, I did see your mental wellness article. So I didn't realize that was part of that. So that's yeah. interesting. I'm glad you brought that up and we'll include notes um, in the show notes, a link to your LinkedIn, as well as maybe a couple of the articles that you want. Yeah. So uh, I think my point, which I, sorry, I didn't mean to get sidetracked, but um, my point is there's a, there's a, someone that built a business around trying to put these products that maybe get stuck, but would make a great roll up. So it sounds like someone that would want to take five or 10 of these or, uh, you know, have one core and then add to the core, that would be an opportunity to work with Sean. Mm, definitely. No, we've had a lot of great conversations with companies on that platform that are exactly like you said, two engineers, three engineers that built right. something over the last two years. Now, maybe they're like, you know, we're just not really good at sales, but we can build stuff yeah. or, Hey, you know, before this is actually one thing that's coming up quite a bit in conversation is, Hey, I was able to work from home and be able to build these products or this company. Now the company I'm at wants me to go back to the office. They're going to see what I do. So I got to offload this company that I built because oh, they did it in a side hustle. Yep. Oh, wow. That's really bizarre. I've been having those conversations quite a bit. The two most common yeah, conversations I've been having in the last, I'd say two months, one, you know, the company I'm at now wants me to come to the office. So we've decided we got to sell this thing or two. Hey, I lost a ton in crypto. I oh no. Sell this thing. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> interesting world, right? Like I'm not too involved in that, but it's obviously been, it's a very volatile space. And I imagine there's a lot of people right now that are kind of stressed or not in mm. the same position. They were like a month or two ago, even. Yeah. <laughs> it's changed a lot. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and I would, I, I guess there would be probably the same profile of person, right? It's like someone that would start a side hustle SaaS business might also have a bunch of crypto and have done pretty well with that. And now suddenly not so much. Yep. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know much about that space, but um, it's interesting to hear that. You definitely, you see memes about it, but I don't <laughs> like, oh, that's interesting that you're actually having those. Well, it's kind of crazy because so many of these people, these not so many, but there is that percentage whose side hustle are tied to the price of Ethereum or, you know, tied to big or whatever, depending yeah. on whatever that side hustle is. <laughs> and whether it was, you know, a marketing company, whether it's a, an FX trade bot, whether it's, mm -hmm. it's the list goes on and on. And, and, you know, it's another conversation I've had just recently that, I mean, I'm not sure how many of these little side conversations, because it is timely. Companies that have left Russia, relocated in other European oh, countries totally. that are, that totally. are now like, Hey, we need, we need clients can, you know, or, or really, yeah. Like they, they've moved their teams to other countries and they're like, listen, we're starting over again. Do you know, do you have anyone in the u.s would like to buy us partner with us anything like this oh, is really? the situation we're in now in fact uh michael if you want i, I got a, a pretty good intro for you later sure for, uh for a person i think you might like yeah because the other side of my life is more mainly around salesforce but um certainly there are less opportunity for custom development just because i you know those are tough projects but there's definitely always people asking so yeah yeah, I'm happy to make any introductions or if I can utilize someone's because I, I saw the same thing like on the Salesforce side of my life um, as a, you know, a Salesforce developer and partner, we had teams that were in Belarus and Ukraine and they moved to a lot of them moved to Poland. Mm -hmm. And it's very shocking for everybody like it's tough for them. They're in a higher, more expensive place to be now. 
um, and it's new and it disrupts everything they were doing. So I, I'm certainly sympathetic to that. There's some great developers out there that, you know, we're kind of forced to pick one side of the world or the other. So it's kind of interesting. Yep. That's crazy. Um, all right. So what, what is one sector that you're seeing, or maybe one company that is really exciting right now? Mm, I mean, specific company can't really, can't really name anything okay. sector. I mean, there's a lot fintechs really interesting to me. Um, there's a, there's a lot. And, and the problem with that is being in Silicon Valley, you're always hearing good things about everything. <laughs> okay. Right. Like no matter like you don't want you like, go, that's terrible. Put your money into it. <laughs> Well, I mean, that everyone, like, like, I got this ag tech cycle. company, I got this solar panel, I, I was pitched the other night on uh, solar panel lemonade charging stations for the desert, right, That's that are standalone with solar panels, and they're just randomly on, on the freeway between here and Vegas. Like you a lemonade stand over, that's solar power? You pull over the side of the road, you get your car charged, <laughs> and you get lemonade at the same time, and I was like, that that idea is like we already got pre-sales i'm like am i missing something i think it's the charging wrong. part that's the important part <laughs> maybe maybe it's, it's like and they have signage the, too and all yeah it might stuff. be the it's, quaint part right which is yeah. oh it's a lemonade stand and i get my ev charge that's probably yeah. the real business model yeah <laughs> that makes sense that might that could be fun right it's like oh let's pull over and get some lemonade and charge the ev so yeah I mean, who knows? Maybe this lemonade is, you know, hundred dollars a glass or something like it's that. Powered by the sun, you know? I guess <laughs> it is powered by the sun, full of synthesis. But dude, there's um, when I was in inter interviewing the constant general of Israel, he was telling me about a company there that has a little electric water creator that just takes water from moisture from the air, and, and you just hold your glass there after a while, and you got a full, you know, glass of makes sense moisture water, and oh, there's you Too just hear all these cool things, so. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes sense because H2O has oxygen in it. So two of them. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Yeah, I think, I don't know if it's like an ion thing. I would, I'd be interested in seeing that text. Yeah. So. All right. But, so, but, but I guess more than anything, maybe, maybe what I am bullish on is just how quickly people are, are able to come up with an idea and scale a company. Literally, I'm seeing companies that were born in a year that are now you know, making a million in revenue with two really? founders. Wow. And, awesome. and it's because they just are able, they find some simple, it's always the simplest thing. You're like, oh my gosh, it's just, you take this and put it there, like a form or a this, you know, we'll always go back to selling the pen or whatever, but, and they're like, yeah, we figured it out. We do these ads and it costs us a dollar and we make $2 and our margins are, are enough. And now we're just, everything's on autopilot and now we're trying to sell it I'm like why and they're like well we're on to our next idea but it's just crazy how you know so many years ago you needed a hundred employees to oh, do yeah. something that two people are doing now or even one Risk was so much higher right like the barrier to entry was very high and ah. i think now you're right like that's why you know we we kind of have a bit of a ethos around rapidly prototype go to real customers and if you can't get someone to give you nominal money, like a hundred bucks for a vaporware idea, because you know, you're going to be able to build it. Yeah. It's not that you, sh you shouldn't build it all the way. You should have something to show and demo that maybe to your point, it's very simple and does one thing really well that you can get out. So I think that's good validation from what you're saying, which is, Hey, look, I'm seeing these businesses that a year ago had an idea, built something quickly and got real customers. Yep. I love it. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's, as you know, like that's what we kind of evangelize, which is don't do a business plan, do a two day startup mm -hmm. and then do a six week accelerator. And then you either have a business or you don't. Yeah. And you learn quickly and you don't need to learn spend, quick. you know, your college tuition or, you know, take a loan out on your house or anything like that to do it. Yeah. yeah I think one of those is better than the other. Yeah. Spend hey, your my college tuition. <laughs> question for you. Are you yeah. seeing, um, or having more questions with with founders on debt, venture debt, or just ways to take loans against revenue or um, purchase order con or anything like that. So I gotta be honest, like I, I don't usually have those types of conversations. I'm usually more interested in or valuable helping people with product or you know getting sales. 
Um, so, but is that something that you're seeing? Because you're more in that type of role. Like I, I wouldn't necessarily have a conversation. I'm having a lot more people ask me like, what is venture debt? How does that work? I'm so having a lot it? more. Oh, so like, say, say you get, um, you raise venture capital from like, uh, you know, just a, 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 yeah, tier one VC or just a VC. But at that time you go to a bank and you just go, hey, I want to take out a loan and you'll get maybe 30, 40% of, you know, say 30 of whatever you raise. So say you raise, you know, 10 million, maybe they'll give you a loan of 3 million hmm. on that. So it extends the runway from maybe, you know, 12 months to 18 months or something like that, hmm. right? Because the bank's looking at it going, oh my gosh, this, you know, great VC has already done all this due diligence on this company. They're back in, you know, we can put in some money here. And um, yeah, so I'm having a lot more conversations on that. I'm having a lot more conversations are, hey, can we take a loan off off our, our, our contracts, the, these, you know, month over month residual contracts? Hey, can we take, how does purchase order financing work? How does, in basically, I'm just having, I think a lot of people are preparing for a potential a tough, market. tough time and just seeing all the options now in anticipation. So interesting yeah yeah and I, i'm i'm glad for that insight from you because you're probably more in that space i really wouldn't interface in that area i'm like i said more of a cto slash business development type conversation mm -hmm. it's like hey you have an idea how do you build it and then launch it but then you know it's important for what you're describing because that would probably be your expertise or someone else that's kind of in that space so it's interesting to hear mm -hmm. and i think i had one company that i introduced you to that was kind of maybe bigger and had that type of need and i was like i have no idea talk to sean so <laughs> i forget you've introduced me to so many great companies so so everyone out there connect with michael <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm i'm definitely just you guys talk <laughs> i know what i'm good at <laughs> uh well i want to be conscious of your time sean as always we could talk forever so let's let's uh wrap with a couple quick things one is if you could only offer one piece of advice to founders what would that be Build your company with the idea that it's going to be sold. And what I mean by that is I'll talk to companies that are like, hey, we're looking to get acquired. We're looking to sell. And once we start talking, it's, it's kind of clear they haven't built out their processes. They haven't done all these things where, you know, the founders are having to do everything themselves or they're in the weeds. They're, they're doing all the tasks. Whereas if you build something to sell, you're building it for increasing the value in every step you're inc you're increasing the automation the processes you're increasing the lack of the founders need to be involved in everything you're just building it out with the idea of all the value drivers and if you do that from the very beginning you're going to have a much better business than if you're just kind of going with the flow and then at the end when you get an acquisition offer or you want to sell or that you're struggling you're going oh my god we gotta make all these changes and as you make those, you realize, man, if I just done these from day one, we would have been such a better company this entire time. So, and it's really interesting you say that because I mean, as you know, like the other part of my life is kind of helping automate and grow, which is the other podcast I had in the book. Um, and we kind of evangelize there like a playbook strategy. So it's interesting to hear you say that because you're at a little later stage. You probably see what I see. I get involved with those companies when there's a mess. <laughs> It's like our CRM is broken, our market automation, we got 12 platforms and we don't know which one to use. And we have no way to onboard people or, or our, you know, our technology we built doesn't talk to any of that. So it's interesting because it sounds like what you're saying is there's a lot of value. And first of all, if a company came to you with, here's our marketing sales and support playbook. Yes. Repeatable processes. And then here's the stuff underneath it, the software that supports that. I mean, it's so nice to talk to someone when they have that playbook. And you can actually say, walk me through the customer's journey, walk me through the tech, walk right. me through. And they can actually go, you know, these are all the steps. And you're like, man, because because that you can also then go back and go, what's great is when they've had the matrix, the metrics for all the past year, like this used to be our our customer acquisition cost. Then we made these changes. Then it was this. Then we made other changes. Oh, yeah, right. Then it was this. And now we're here and, and you could see like, okay, what changes, but you see how it got so much more efficient over time and to see that history and also with the lifetime value of customers, like there's certain 
certain metrics, and I'm sure you're, you're familiar with this in SaaS companies that people track now, if you start tracking those early on and see them improving over time, that's a great, great sign for, for your company and, and for the valuation. Oh, that's, that's great feedback. I didn't, we didn't practice this as you, people probably can tell, but <laughs> um, for if you or anyone else that's watching this or any of your clients ever want, I'm happy to send them a copy of Automate and Grow. Um, or, you know, we have kind of these frameworks where they can build their own sales, marketing and support playbooks. So just um, I'll include those in the show notes. And if you have anyone, please make sure that I'm, I'm happy to send them that because I have found anyone that's willing to do it. It's a very useful exercise and they don't have to keep redoing it. It kind of becomes a set of living documents that they can base the whole business on and kind of, you know, tweak as they go. So it's interesting you're saying that. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. I got to read your book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's always helpful. <laughs> I mean, I don't say you have to read it. I can give you the reader's digest version of it, of course, but in, in the end it's, that's what it is. It's, you know, build a digital product plan and then automate marketing, sales, and support. And what we say is build playbooks for these things before you build technology, or if you've already got technology, that'll tell you how to fix it. That's pretty much what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, let's wrap with a few uh, quick questions. One is how do people get in touch with you, Sean? Uh, best is through my LinkedIn, to be honest. It's just okay. Sean Flynn. Um, the only, I'm not sure if everyone's going to be watching the video, but handsome guy right here, or go to the Silicon Valley podcast.com and, uh, connect with me there, but either or LinkedIn, LinkedIn's the best for me. Beautiful. We'll include all that in the show notes and more. Um, the final thing is, as you know, when we have interesting people on the podcast, we like you to nominate other interesting people. We typically talk to people that are in the, you know, the startup eco space. So sometimes it's, venture guys or angels and other times it's founders. So who would you, Sean, like to nominate as a future guest of the Form Your Own Pack podcast? There, there's a person that was on a panel with me not too long ago, uh, Marcel uh, Bilser. And the reason I think he'd be a great guest for a future episode, he was at Gold, Goldman Sachs. He used to manage and his minimum client was 20 million assets under management. Now he's with another company, but he's focused on working with early stage founders okay. and working with them for one area. There's a lot of founders that have vested shares, restricted stock units, ISOs and that, and they don't quite understand the financials of them <laughs> and the tax implications and setting them up in that where that's kind of what he's working on. So I think it might benefit your, your audience who's, sure. you know early in on the game, an early employee founder that what all that stuff actually means so that you can really set it up for themselves for that big win later on. Oh, interesting. Okay. And it's Marcel, right? Yeah, Marcel. I, I'll do the email intro yeah, right perfect. after. And, and I, I, I got others recommendations. Not if sure. you want, you just let me know. <laughs> I'll just keep sending them your way. Yeah, that's terrific. Well, I appreciate that. Sean, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And we look forward to doing an event with Bay Angels in particular. Okay. That's exciting news. I'm happy to support your mission at Bay Angels and maybe we can do some fun event in San Francisco before the end of the year. Oh, that'd be fun. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.